numbers today. Survey says Hillary Clinton leads Trump 46 to 37 percent amongst likely voters in the four-way matchup. That lead is slightly smaller than Clinton's margin in this survey yesterday before Monday respondents were added in, suggesting that Trump's debate performance may have helped him avoid more of a freefall. But Trump's path to nomination still appears to be much steeper than it was just one week ago. So how is Donald Trump responding to all this? Today, he launched one of his trademark Twitter tirades. He called House Speaker Paul Ryan a, quote, weak and ineffective leader. And he lashed out at who, someone he called very foul mouth, Senator John McCain, for disendorsing him over the weekend. And in what appears to be Trump's framing of his campaign strategy down the final stretch, he also wrote this on Twitter. It is so nice that the shackles have been taken off me and I can now fight for America the way I want to. So what does this unshackled Donald Trump do next? Well, he released a new campaign TV ad that revisits the topic of Hillary Clinton's health. Our next president faces daunting challenges in a dangerous world. Iran promoting terrorism, North Korea threatening, ISIS on the rise, Libya and North Africa in chaos. Hillary Clinton failed every single time as Secretary of State. Now she wants to be president. Hillary Clinton doesn't have the fortitude, strength, or stamina to lead in our world. She failed as Secretary of State. Don't let her fail us again. So, John, to the extent that you can discern a formula here, is Trump's new gambit a potential path to victory for him, or is it pure kamikaze? See what it says up there on our wall? It says apocalypse now. See who that is? That's Donald Trump there looking look like Colonel Kurtz. Yes, I had this thought, I had the Marlon Brando, I had this thought last night. You know, Kurt, Kurt, Colonel Kurtz went up the river, you know, and surrounded himself with a bunch of guys in uh, Cambodia and they treated him like a god and he gradually just went totally insane. That's what that's about. I, 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 look, I think this is a, a strategy. I said this yesterday on the show, having seen him yesterday in Pennsylvania, and today he's just doing even more of it, like we're amped up to 11, which is a great strategy if you want to get the base, your base, the 37% of people right now that are in this NBC Wall Street Journal poll who are for him to be really excited and pumping their fists and yelling and screaming at the television, but it is not a strategy to expand your voting pool to the point that you even get back in contention, let alone win the presidency I've of only, the United States. I've only made this joke on TV twice, so I'm going to make it once again. If okay, he's let's, running, going to be funny. If he's running to be, if he's running to be editor in chief of Breitbart, yeah. he's got a good platform. Yeah. Look, for Trump to become president. He has to get Republicans back on his side. Yeah. So it's possible that if he does all this stuff, he regains uh, the people he's lost over the last few days, and then beats her in the debate, more Clinton disclosures, uh, this ad breaks through. I mean, it's, it's, still, it's still a real struggle, but, but, but because he's currently being seen through the prism of unhinged, out of control, all of this stuff just causes him to have a bad day. Dude, here's the thing. You're right. He's got to get Republicans back. But who are the Republicans that have left? Not the hardcore Trump people. The Republicans who are like establishment where I did in the middle of the electorate, right? The moderate Republicans. Those are the ones who fled. So he's attacking John McCain. He's attacking Paul Ryan. He's running an ad that looks like that ad from 2008 that the McCain campaign was afraid to run at right. the end of the campaign. Right. That's like apocalypse now. Trump lashes That's at, not gonna Trump lashes at people, people often just out of pure petulance. Yeah. But he also lashed us out of people to send a message to other people, do not cross me. That is a thing that can work if you're six months out and you're trying to get people in line. Sure. But 30 days out. And if you're on the rise. Yeah. But not, not 30, if you're flailing. 30 days out, all he's doing is making more enemies. All he's doing is setting the message of disarray. Yeah, I totally agree. And not getting back the Republicans you're talking about, who he needs. Another thing that people are still talking about on this very topic is House Speaker Paul Ryan's telling House Republicans yesterday that they should feel free to flee from Donald Trump if that is what's necessary to save their skins and thereby help their party retain its majority in the lower chamber. We are told that Ryan, despite what he said yesterday, still hasn't ruled out rescinding his endorsement of Trump at some point in the future, but Ryan has so far shied away from public spats with his party's nominee. Donald Trump has not. Today, during that social media rampage, Trump targeted Ryan by tweeting, quote, despite winning the second debate in a landslide 
parentheses, every poll. <laughs> uh, it's hard to do well when Paul Ryan and others give zero support, exclamation point, close quotes. Trump also tweeted, our very weak and ineffective leader, Paul Ryan, had a bad conference call where his members went wild at his disloyalty. The speaker has been in a tough position for months. Mark, as Trump's campaign troubles heighten concerns that Republicans could lose the House, has Ryan's goal changed here, or is it merely as his method of achieving it? I think before he was making the case and convincing himself that Donald Trump could be elected president and that he would sign things into law that would be more conservative than Hillary Clinton. I know, think he no longer thinks Trump can win. I believe he no longer wants Trump to win, although he's not going to say that. What, he, what he's trying to do now is save the House to try to have a bulwark against a Speaker Pelosi and, uh, and uh, all Democratic control. Kellyanne Conway is going to be doing a call with some House members. Mike Pence has been communicating with Paul Ryan. But basically, Paul Ryan now is saying, this is not my goal to get Donald Trump elected uh, president. Go back to the period when Ryan was meditating on whether to endorse Trump or not. When he offered the endorsement, what he kind of said was, I'm going to offer it on the condition of that he, you take some tutelage from me. Outsource the policy part of your campaign to me. Yesterday in Pennsylvania, when I saw him, he was railing against free trade and railing against entitlement reform, two of the pillars of what Paul Ryan believes need to happen. Yeah. And I believe at this moment that if Paul Ryan, if you asked him who you were likely to get actual entitlement reform, deficit reduction, and trade deals that he would like, Paul Ryan, he bets, he's betting Hillary Clinton will be easier to work with to get those things done than Donald Trump. Yeah. Ryan, before calculus was, the best chance to save our majority is to have Trump run well. Right. I think now he's going to take the position, the best way to keep a majority is to warn Republicans, right. you must turn out, don't, I don't care if you vote for Donald Trump, but you must turn out to vote for House Republicans. But, but not just, again, I agree with you about that, but it's not just that he wants to save the majority. I actually think that if Ryan looks down the road at what could yield the policy outcomes he wants, a Clinton presidency with a Republican House and either chamber, whatever the control is on the Senate I don't, I don't think he thinks more likely, side, but mixed bag. I, I, I just, mixed look, bag. Trump has rejected all of the things that he would want him to embrace on policy Not grants. all of them. Not conservative most, judges. Most. Well, okay. All but that. Yeah. Okay. A fair few enough. other things, too. All right. Fair on enough. the flip side of Trump's tribulations, I give you Hillary Clinton. She is whistling a happy tune these days. Her poll numbers are up. Yesterday in Columbus, Ohio, she drew what is said to be her largest crowd of the entire campaign. Take a look at this New York Times photo. It looks like almost like a Trump rally or Bernie Sanders. This is from last night on the campus of The Ohio State in Columbus. Secret Service says there were more than 18K in attendance. Clinton's outdoor event yesterday was well-timed. It was a show of strength when the campaign needed one because her campaign usually holds events during the day when there are fewer people there because they're at work. So this was a big rally to keep her momentum going. They had another big rally today in Miami where Clinton appeared alongside Vice President Al Gore. More on that later. Meanwhile, however, for the second day in a row, WikiLeaks dropped additional hacked emails allegedly from the inbox of Clinton's campaign chair, John Podesta. Lots of new revelations here, including an email from March that suggested Donna Brazile who was then a paid commentator and analyst for CNN, is now the interim chair, of course, the Democratic National Committee, tipped off Clinton's campaign about a question that was coming at a CNN town hall. In other circumstances, leaks like this would be making much bigger waves in the political world. And again, there's more in there that's being digged over now. But most of these things are being drowned out, including on this program to some extent, by all the dysfunction that Donald Trump is creating within the Republican Party. So, John, as we continue to look at some of these WikiLeaks questions, including the ones involving the chair of the DNC, Donna Brazil, and other people of Clinton's orbit, what would it take for Clinton to lose a news cycle? I'm going to go really, like, super simple here, right? All, all I can tell you, I don't know what it would take, but it would take controversy that's not inside baseball. Everything that's coming out of these WikiLeaks things so far is inside baseball. Trump has, has been, the reason Trump has been a potent force in our electoral politics in the last 16 months is because he talks in a language and about issues in a big, bold way that's not about all this inside stuff. And all this Clinton stuff is stuff that we might get interested in, the Politico might be interested in, but it's not stuff that when Trump hammers on it, it just seems so small compared to the controversies in his campaign, which everyone in the country yeah. understands. The problem the Republicans have with this stuff is, there's, first of all, there's a lot of stuff, but all of it is kind of medium grade. Don't and all of it speaks to, again, inside stuff like the Clinton's, you know, strat the Clinton team strategize. 
people complained about other members of the team. Right. Now, there's some questions about the State Department there's some, and, and the functions there. There's some questions about uh, whether there's improper conduct with the Justice Department. That's there are some serious yes, questions to I be agree. looked at. But, but again, it's as you suggested, it's so much smaller in the way this campaign has covered the freak show media circus well, that Donald Trump fighting with the Speaker of the House himself, not Hillary Clinton, this is all involved her staff for the most part. It's just, it's, it's going to be, I, it's hard for Trump to win a news cycle right now. As unfair as Republicans see that as being, it's going to be hard for her unless right. the polls come out and it turns out that all this speculation yes. about Trump being damaged, if he starts to be even in polling, yeah, yeah, yeah. he could win a news yeah, cycle, I she just, could lose one. I just say, I'll just say again, you know, you read the New York Times account of what these emails have revealed, it's fascinating. Like, I'm really interested. I love that kind of stuff. But like arguments about how to like leak the key the, her keystone position you know donna brazil dropping a question or something i mean i get it like it's like i get it there's nothing else going on we could obsess all day about it but you know compared to intimations of sexual assault i mean it just yes, and the speaker pans. of the house and john mccain yes. fighting with yes the and the republican yes. anarchy the whole yes. party melting down yes. it's just nothing all right. all right when we come back the sights and sounds of hillary clinton's day with al gore after these words from our sponsors So, uh, Mark mentioned earlier that Hillary Clinton shared a stage with Al Gore today in Miami, Florida. There is a lot, a lot of history, and not always the greatest history, between Clinton and Gore. Since the two of them competed for influence in the White House two decades ago, Hillary Clinton and Al Gore have not been the chummiest of political pals. Gore made a late endorsement of Clinton in the cycle and didn't attend the Democratic convention, all of which made their joint appearance debut today all the more fascinating. There was, of course, First and foremost and most noticeable, their body language. The two of them stood a little bit far apart, but they also eventually embraced and applauded throughout the rally. And here's what they had to say about each other. What I am most excited about is to be here with one of the world's foremost leaders on climate change, Al Gore. Those 30 years of leadership led Al Gore to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. I was very proud. There isn't anybody who knows more, has done more, has worked harder. I can't wait to have 
Al Gore advising me when I am President of the United States. Hillary Clinton will make solving the climate crisis a top national priority. Your vote really, really, really counts. You can consider me as an exhibit A of that truth. <laughs> with Hillary Clinton, we'll build on the progress made under President Obama with the Paris uh, Agreement. She has proposed a terrific plan. I went through that with a fine tooth comb. And I will tell you that her plan on solar panels and expanding renewable energy, it is right at the, the, the limit of what we can do, and that is exactly the kind of ambitious goal that we need from the next president of the United States of America. So, Mark, I would say with all due immodesty that the two of us have kind of PhDs almost in goreology. Um, we've been studying that guy and Hillary Clinton together for a long time. So just give me, let's just talk about your cosmic thoughts about what went down today. Well, they were rivals in the White House from the very beginning of the Clinton-Gore administration. And over the years, they have not been close. The, the Gore family uh, felt that the, Bill Clinton's conduct in the White House really hurt his chances of, right. of winning more soundly than and he did were, the popular vote. And they were vote. disgusted by it. Yeah. And, um, and uh, today was a sign of all hands on deck for the Democrats and the desire of Hillary Clinton to use Al Gore to not necessarily appeal directly to millennials, but it's kind of a bank shot to appeal to two groups, millennials who care about climate change and get immediate attention for that, and to appeal to Floridians and others in states that might be close because Al Gore, of course, is the world's leading expert on every vote count. So uh, stunning to see them together, uh, but no doubt, you know, Al Gore continues to have a jaundiced view of the Clintons. Right. Well, let's see, just to unpack it a little bit more. They, they, they were not, they were rivals because of the fact that Gore believed he was vice president and Hillary Clinton believed she was vice president. He believed as vice president he should be the second so most powerful, powerful person, person in, the country. in the administration. Right. And so they fought, I mean, they really like, they both fought for, fought for Bill Clinton's ear throughout the time. As you said, the Gores had a very jaundiced view about Hillary Clinton, um, for, for about Bill Clinton because of his behavior. Um, Hillary Clinton also had a jaundiced view about Al Gore in a lot of ways and thought he was politically maladroit and he wasn't sufficiently liberal and there or a variety of things, right? So they, they have never liked each other, and Gore was miserable in the White House, and a lot of the part of his misery was to do with her. But he really still cares a lot about this issue about climate change. His reputation has taken a little bit of a beating in the past few years after he sold current TV uh, to the Qataris. Uh, a, lot on the, a lot of people on the left thought it was kind of hypocritical to sell it to an oil-producing nation. Um, he, he wants a platform. He still believes in that inconvenient truth stuff, and he also is still so bitter over what happened in 2000 and the extent of his feeling that the election was eventually stolen from him. And, you know, he, like all Democrats, regards Trump as a menace. That's right. So he, the wants, last to, point's so really he, wants, he wants to be out there. He does not want to see this thing happen again. His message today was that, and I think he really feel, feels it in a very heartfelt way. Yeah. I mean, look, you have to understand part of the psychology of Al Gore is he won the popular vote. More people went to the polls in Florida right. intending to vote for yes. him. He should have been president by his, his judgment. Right. And so he has dabbled in presidential politics since then, but he has largely stayed out of it. Right. And to see him come back today, I think this event may not be a total one-off, but you could imagine a world in which he'd be out there a lot more for her. And the fact that they've done one, again, is testament to the all-hands-on-deck, well, not to the rapprochement between and, them. And I'll say the other thing we both know about Al Gore is he hates politics, right? I mean, he's the guy who, more than almost anybody I've ever met, desperately wanted to be president but did never wanted to do anything Thing that it would take to get there. Yep. To get him out on stage gives you a sense of what he thinks the stakes are in this election. Even once tells you because he hates doing this. All right, when we come back, a Clinton advisor and a Trump advisor walk into the core club here in Gotham City. We will show you what happens next right after this.
bit earlier today. John and I hosted an event at New York City's Core Club with two important political fundraisers for the leading presidential hopefuls. We were joined by Anthony Scaramucci, who is the founder of an investment firm and a Trump economic policy advisor, and Mark Lazary, a hedge fund manager and an advisor to Hillary Clinton. Here is what Scaramucci had to say about what he thinks of Donald Trump's chances of winning the presidential election. I would say that right to... now, and I think Mark will probably agree with me, there's a one in five shot or one in ten, somewhere between one in ten, one in five. Because what you know about politics is that anything can happen. Look at the polls. So, so I would say 20%. Would, what, what would I'm hoping he has a higher yeah. chance than well, that. That's the British mark. The Mooch later took to Twitter to reiterate that his political forecast was based on polling and prediction markets, but that Mr. Trump, quote, always exceeded those expectations. So what do you think of one of Donald Trump's supporters suggesting that his chances are not a mortal lock? Well, I thought, I thought Scaramucci was being honest there, and it was, he, was, he was fairly, he was, he, he, to, be, to be totally fair to him, he defended Donald Trump throughout the thing, made a lot of arguments in favor of why he was still with Donald Trump, made an extended argument for why he was still with him even after the, what came out in these tapes. Um, but, you know, he can read the polls. He, these guys work with numbers all day long. They're looking at numbers, and he is looking at the prediction markets, and he's looking at the polls that we've all seen um, and making, I think, a pretty accurate assessment of where anybody who's actually in touch with reality would think the race is right now. Part of a pro the problem for Donald Trump right now goes back to something we discussed before. Every Trump surrogate is going to be asked about the controversies involving the Trump campaign because everybody's hearing all about them. They involve Donald Trump himself. Yeah. The problem is Democratic surrogates, members of Congress, fundraisers, people like Mark Lazary, they're not being asked about every Clinton scandal, in part because reporters can't keep up with the minutia of every one of them, right. and in part because not everyone's going to have an opinion about it or, or should, should be called on to have an opinion about it. And as I said before, they're just not as relatable. You can ask Scaramucci about what does his wife think about Trump? What does his daughter, his daughters, what does he say to his daughters? Right. That's a, a question. But if you asked, if you asked a, a Clinton surrogate, what does your wife think about or your husband think about, about Donna, Donna Brazil's, Brazil's maybe passing maybe a question off. from a debate. It's not the same. It's, not the it's same. hard. It's not fair to the Republicans in some ways, but I see the dynamic and why it exists. All right. That was not all that Anthony Scaramucci had to say about this election. Here's what he told us when we asked him what Donald Trump should do between now and November if he wants to win the election. What I would be focused on right now is I would get a balance sheet out and I would get those 90-second clips that he did, the one that he did on Friday night or the apology, and I would say, okay, here's where, here, here's where I stand on these issues. This is why it's beneficial to working-class families and the middle class. This is where the secretary stands on those issues. This is why these issues will be debilitating to the middle class. And I would stream it and go right over the top of the mainstream media, right to the American people, uh, and more so than he can with a 20 or 30,000 person crowd. And I would lay out each thing, whether it's immigration, trade, any of these things. I would also get his surrogates to be better coordinated than they currently are, so that when that message is coming out from him, they can go out with a message that's similar to the message that he's beaming in on the 90 seconds. Uh, of course, Scaramucci, they're making an argument for Trump being basically policy focused at the very moment that Trump was releasing the ad attacking Hillary Clinton and raising her health. So he's kind of, it's an interesting prescription, but kind of fantasy land. Again, from yesterday, spending time watching Mike Pence give a couple speeches, they have a policy argument that revs up the base, I think, in a broader base than the, than the tack Trump is taking now. But he obviously is not going to pursue a campaign based on policy in the new ad today makes that pretty clear. Yeah. All right, during the event, Mark Lazary, the Democrat, also talked about his belief that centrism in this country is now shifted to the left. At the end of the day, right now, with the issues that we have, and you sort of, and you've seen it with what's happened with Bernie, I think our country, you know, what was center has moved a little bit. It isn't where it was four years ago or eight years ago. You are going to need more government invention. I, I know, you know, the feeling is for it to be in the center, it's less government invention. But I think with the issues that you have out there, you're going to need more government invention. So I asked him, as I do a lot of Clinton surrogates, what position she's taken in the center, and he didn't really have an answer. Right. And, you know, I think uh, there's, there's, I don't know if the center has shifted, because clearly the right has moved further to the right, the left has moved further to the left. But I think we're in the things that Mark Lazary is concerned about, about economic stuff, there's no doubt I think that the Democratic center has moved to the left. Yeah. And, and cultural politics across the country have moved to the right. left. You have gay marriage, but legalization. But on ec and economics, you never hear talk about 
reforming entitlements, no. reinventing no. government, no. eliminating waste. No. Well, those are None 90s those arguments. Things. Those are, I mean, those are 90s New Democrat arguments, right. and the party's not where that, it's not like that anymore in the Democratic Party. Yeah. It just has moved to the left. Yeah. It's fascinating to hear those two guys who, who are friendly with each other agree about a fair amount, including both of them thinking that a President Clinton and a Speaker Ryan could, could actually get, get a lot of work done. done. Yeah, very yeah. smart guys. Yep. Yeah. All right, coming up. We talked to a trio of political titans about the state of the presidential race. Won't want to miss that. Stay tuned. We'll be back with more with all due respect right after this. Our next guest tonight is three guests tonight. From Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, we have American Values President Gary Bauer, a former Republican presidential candidate and a current Donald Trump supporter. From Boston, we've got Jeb Bush's former campaign strategist, Dave Kochel. And out in Los Angeles, we are joined by a Democratic strategist who was a senior advisor to the aforementioned Al Gore's presidential campaign, Robert Shrum. Gentlemen, um, what an incredible trio you are. Um, I want to just, I'm going to go, you guys can't see us here. We're going to, you're lined up, uh -oh. you're lined up ideologically in a kind of odd way, but I'm going to kind of move across here. I'm going to ask Gary Bauer and then Bob Shrum and then Dave Kochel, where's the race right now, Gary Bauer? Is this race, as many people think, Republican, Democrat alike, is this race basically over? No, look, it, it, it ain't ever over till it's over. I, I think whether it's sports or politics, you get up every morning and you fight as if you can win. And it's important for the ticket for Trump Pence uh, to approach the rest of the campaign exactly that way. You go on and make your points. There's a, a tremendous amount of vulnerabilities for Hillary Clinton. Uh, one of them being, which has gotten kind of buried in all of this, is that a good bit of the industrial base of this country has been devastated and people that have been voting Democrat for years feel that their party has abandoned them. Those are new people for the Republican Party if it's got enough of a brain to accept them. And I think they need to keep making the case for those people and for Clinton corruption and what that would mean for four more years in Washington, D.C. All right, Gary Bauer, pro-Trump Republican, says the race is not yet over. Uh, Bob Shrum, I know what you're going to say, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Is the race over, Bob? Should we stick a fork in it? 
I thought it was over on Labor Day, said it on your show, thought Trump was in a demographic cul-de-sac he couldn't get out of. He's made it worse and worse since then. Uh, none of his message, by the way, about, say, the industrial base is coming through at all. And in any event, if you look at a state like Pennsylvania, the latest poll shows him losing that state by 12 percent. In fact, if you go state by state in the battlegrounds, she's ahead in virtually every one of them. I don't see what he's going to do to recover. I think what he did in the debate was get himself a few more Republicans who really dislike the Clintons, but he's stuck at about 39 or 40 percent. He can't win the election with that 39 or 40 percent. All right. So Bob Shrum predictably saying the race is over. It's true. You did say the race is over Labor Day. You <laughs> told me that. I know you're being consistent. So now we move to the tiebreaker here. Dave Kochel, Republican, but not a big fan of Donald Trump's. Give us the, 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 the clear, uh, unbiased view. Dave, <laughs> is the race over? So, yeah, I'll be the tiebreaker. The race is over. Uh, time of death was about uh, 10 o'clock the night of the first debate. It's been downhill ever since. And, um, you know, you can't bring one or two people into the front door of the party while you're you know, pushing 20 or 30 out the back. So I think it's, it's over and it's been long over. And uh, we're just on the slide now to see what, see what happens in the last 30 days. I want to ask all of your questions. Start again you, with well, you know, Go ahead, Gary. I'm sorry. Go on. I start with Gary, yeah, but I want you all, all to address this. You've all supported candidates who've done bad things in their personal lives. Every one of you has. Um, Gary, you're supporting a candidate now who on Friday was revealed to have done something that horrifies a lot of people, disgusts a lot of people. What would Donald Trump have to do for you to withdraw your support if it wasn't that tape? Look, I, I don't even think in, in those terms, in all due respect, uh, everybody, I, I know this might be news to some folks, but everybody that has ever run for any office in America and every voter that has voted for them, theologically, according to my beliefs as a, as a Christian, are sinners. They've all done things, said things, looked at things, but Gary, violated Gary, various Gary, commandments, Gary, et cetera. You, but, it's but, but, policy. Right. It's, well, let me, let yeah. me just finish this, the thought. Yeah, go ahead. It's policy that matters. And the fact of the matter is that Donald Trump has the right positions on growing the economy, shrinking government, uh, lower so, taxes, so, pro-life, so, so, defending yeah. religious liberty, and Hillary Clinton is engaged in a cover-up of her corruption and an apologist for her so, husband. So, Gary, why don't you forgive that? If you're, if you're, well, if, I, if you personally I, and a theologically, it's not, it's not me to forgive. I, well, I, I don't oppose them because of their their activities. I oppose them because they're wrong philosophically. Well, but but you, her but, but many, of, many supporters of Donald Trump have been critical of President Clinton, for instance, for his personal failings. Why, why, why are you, why are you yeah, less well, forgiving personally I, I, mean, I don't speak for every for evangelical well, or I understand, every values voter. I'm, I'm trying to the, understand. The, I'm in trying an understand. election, the issues yeah. ought to be the differences on policy between the candidates. It's night and day. Have you ever, By the way, yeah. uh, Al Gore uh, was down in Florida uh, campaigning for uh, Hillary Clinton today. I seem to remember that Al Gore was publicly accused of being a sexual assaulter by uh, multiple right. would you, would you, would you forgive in him? multiple would cities, you forgive him and for she that? campaigns would you, with him in Florida Would you today. forgive him for that and say he's a sinner and you forgive him? I'm, I'm, pick, I'm pointing out the hypocrisy of the left okay. acting like a 10-year-old tape is somehow horrifying when the left yep. in this country yep. has been associated with radical social policy. Right. Okay, Bob, let me ask you to critique Gary's answers. Well, I think it's absurd. I think it's entirely unfair to bring up that charge against Al Gore, which was never substantiated. The, what Donald Trump did, <laughs> what he said, has come out of his own mouth. I what think he he's said. been condemned, what not he, just— he said, Gary, Bob. I didn't interrupt you, so why don't you not interrupt me, okay? This guy, well, it just it's not just what he said. Ten, said. Gary, don't interrupt. You can't win the argument by interrupting. Look, what, what Donald Trump said 10 or 11 years ago, when he was, by the way, a 59-year-old man, not some college kid, was outrageous. But he said things like it 
over and over and over again. He said them in this campaign to Megyn Kelly. He said them in the first debate uh, about Rose. Uh, uh, I mean, he just does it over and over and over again. I mean, I could go through all the quotes. Piggy. I mean, we've seen them all. This is who he is. And I think it makes it very Anything difficult the issues, to right, take Bob? somebody to take somebody that unstable. It's not just about his private sexual conduct or his private sexual comments or his attitudes toward women. It's somebody who is so unstable, so anxious to be vengeful, so ready to strike out that makes him unacceptable as president of the United Dave, States. Dave Cottrell, how do you think Speaker uh, Ryan? Mis mishandling classified information appeasing Iran. Stop, okay, Gary, stop. Gary, kidding Gary, Gary, stop. That's what we're talking about right <laughs> this minute. Uh, Dave Castro, how would you evaluate how Speaker Ryan has handled the last 48 hours? Well, he's in a difficult situation. I mean, it's a it's lose lose. What are you going to do at this point? Uh, the the strategy they needed was a few months ago uh, that uh, Mike Kaufman in in Colorado used, which is look, don't don't give Hillary Clinton a blank check. They've known for a long time the direction this campaign was headed, and and Gary Bauer can twist himself into whatever kind of pretzel he wants to. The truth is, we're going to have to come up with a whole new <laughs> definition of hypocrisy to. You know, to to talk about how uh, you know the religious right is supporting a guy like Donald Trump, even after what's come out. And by the way, uh, we haven't seen the last of it. There's plenty more. Uh, I'd say run for your lives. What I can't, I, I understand what Donald Trump is yeah. doing right now. I understand, you know, the, the situation, the campaigns, and what I can't understand is anybody defending him. Uh, you know, he, he's going he's gonna to napalm the whole village and, and, and you know, <laughs> to, to try to win a battle that is lost already. The, the problem is, you know, nobody survives in the village when it's all over. I think, you know, we got to get as far away from this thing as we possibly can as Republicans and start to define what the party is. Uh, you know, on, on November 9th, that'll probably be the most important day of this election because uh, it'll be over and we that, can start you know, that to, would, that would be you know, great to assign to define what, you know, what the, what the path forward Republican needs to be. And I hope that we can get together with some people who by the uh, support party. Mr. Trump. But the, the truth is we can't win an election this way. I mean, we've never seen a candidate implode like this uh, 28 days out from an election, at least not in modern times. Gary, I'm going to ask you a couple questions now, but while I do it, I'm going to ask you, please just try to not to talk over the other guests who are on the show because it's not helpful to our viewers. They can't hear sure. them. It's, it's a little okay. rude. I, I, I guess I've, I've, been, I've watched I, too much of the Kane debate. I, I, I understand. <laughs> well, again, I just a, a minute ago you were talking about how this should all be about policy, and then you just launched an ad hominem attack on, on Al Gore. So I'm trying to figure out like whether you want to talk about policy or whether you want to talk about the alleged personal indiscretions of a former vice president who's done well, one, I, who's done one campaign event in this event in this uh, in this campaign so far. W which is it, policy or personality? What do you I'm want to talk about? I'm trying to figure out whether the left That's is not, serious I don't, I don't hear about, about the, sexual assault. I don't want to hear about the left, Gary. You just said you want to talk when, about policy. You said you wanted to talk about policy, and literally the next words out of your mouth were Al Gore masseuses, massage. Like, what, what do you I, want to talk I, about? You want I'm to talk about policy? To, I'm trying. You want me to answer your question, or I, are you going to filibuster your own show? Well, it is my show, so I'm, I'm gonna... trying to figure out whether these these issues of personal conduct actually matter or not to the left. That's the only thing they're raising about Donald Trump. They're afraid to fight on the issues of open borders, trade deals that gut our economy, right. uh, appeasement of Iran. Go down the list. If the campaign was about those issues. Hillary Clinton wouldn't see the light okay, so, of day. So, Gary, let me, so let me all ask. the left no. has with Le their with their Republican friends is to try to smear the Republican candidate. And by the way, I can't ever imagine uh, Harry Reid or Nancy Pelosi bailing out on a Democrat presidential candidate. And in fact, they didn't say a word when Hillary Clinton spent the last three years obstructing justice and destroying evidence right. that was central to an investigation of her mishandling of classified information. Bob, there's a lot to work with there. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm just going to let you pick and choose what you'd like to respond to there. And, and again, Gary, if you could just let Bob speak, please. One, these are completely Fine. baseless attacks on Hillary Clinton. She said using a private email server was a mistake. She's not going to make excuses for it. There's no evidence that anybody got hold of any confidential information because of that. The FBI director, who's a Republican, said there's no basis to move forward here. That's number one. Number two, the, the recipe that Gary is offering for the Republican Party to go forward 
is a recipe that would doom that party for a long time. If you look at the polling data, it is absolutely clear that Americans are far closer by a good majority to Hillary Clinton's positions on immigration right. reform than they are to Donald Trump's. Okay. If the Republican Party is going to go out there and say, we want to take away a woman's right to choose, we want to restrict the rights of women, we don't respect um, women, okay. we don't believe in equal pay, or we're going to take away LGBT rights and religious freedom is their kind of euphemism for that, yep. that Republican Party will lose with the rising American electorate, not only this year, but for years and years right. to come. Okay. Finally, I just have to say, Al Gore is one of the most honorable people I've ever met. Those uh, allegations are entirely unsubstantiated, and Gary is just throwing mud to try to, to, to make a case for somebody for whom, for whom you cannot make a case. It was Donald Trump who smeared himself. No one else smeared him. Okay, let's let's finish with um, some metrics here. I wanted to start with Dave, then Bob, then Gary. Tell me who's going to win, and what percentage of the overall popular vote they're going to get. Dave, uh, Hillary Clinton's going to win overall percentage of the popular vote. It's going to be around 47, 48, and uh, electorally it'll be. Uh, you know, over a hundred electoral votes. Although I will say that uh, there's a possibility that Donald Trump could win a state or two. The governor Romney did not win. There will be uh, that many states or more that he will lose that Governor Romney did win. Bob, you, I know you think Hillary's uh, going to win. What percentage of the popular vote will she get? I, I, I think uh, I think Dave's about right. I think it's 46, 47, 48 percent of the vote, right. and I think she's headed right now for around 340, 345 electoral votes. Gary, tougher for you because your guy's currently behind. So what number does he need to get, will he get to, to win? Yeah, you know, I'm not even going to go down that road. I'm not a political prosticator, but I do believe that if, God forbid, Hillary Clinton wins, it will be a failed presidency because it will be the same policies of the last eight years that have devastated our economy and weakened us abroad. Um, Gary Bauer, Bob Shrum, Dave Kochel. Heretofore known forevermore as the Three Amigos. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and with that, uh, you guys are great. We're going to have you all back on the show. Actually, it would be kind of awesome to have them all here in one room because there would be fisticuffs. Um, up next, we'll have, uh, and we love fisticuffs, there'll be two reporters on this show talking about Hillary Clinton's attempts to convert Republican voters. We'll be right back with them.
now by two ace political reporters who've been covering this campaign oh so closely. Ann Guerin from the Washington Post, Caitlin Huey Burns from Real Clear Politics. Thank you both for being here. And tell me what you're currently wondering about regarding this campaign. What's something you're wondering about? Well, I'm wondering how uh, Hillary Clinton is going to fill uh, 27 days of, of active, mostly active campaigning uh, and, and do so without, um, you know, either opening up a controversy, uh, making a mistake, uh, but keeping the, the momentum going. Uh, she tried today to, to, to do a little bit of that by introducing a new policy proposal. She actually hasn't introduced any new policy proposals. And trotting at Al Gore. It, well, there you go. So we, it was a twofer. Um, so, yeah, Al Gore and climate change uh, in Florida and also a, a middle class tax credit. Uh, that was the sort of thing she was doing months ago uh, to do it this late in, in the campaign when it really doesn't actually draw any discernible new uh, uh, demographic or, or voter group to her. Uh, suggests to me that they're looking for some ways that she can start to make the argument look, I'm actually going to be president and here's how I would govern. Here's some, here's a few things I want to do right off the bat. Caitlin, they've, they've uh, been very cautious in Brooklyn and saying, we're just trying to get 270. We're not trying to win in a landslide. Is it possible they're rethinking that now? Well, I think they have to. I mean, looking at the polling heading into the weekend, before all of this news broke, Donald Trump was behind nationally and in key battleground states. Now we're seeing the polling uh, widen, actually. Um, their, the NBC Wall Street Journal poll had uh, 11 points uh, before the debate. Now it's nine. The Trump campaign is saying that that's an improvement of sorts, uh, that they think that the, the debate for them was a uh, will have a rallying effect among their base and some Republicans, and we've seen that kind of play into the calculations that Paul Ryan is thinking about. Um, but this is, you know, you're looking at, uh, in our Real Clear Politics polling average, Clinton is leading in every battleground state, except we were talking in, earlier about Iowa. Um, leading in, in places like, uh, you know, obviously Virginia and Colorado, but also Pennsylvania by wide margins, Florida now. Uh, this is a really tough race. So you've been writing a fair amount about what's going on on Capitol Hill right now with Paul Ryan and this whole kind of anarchy in the, in the Republican Party. Mark and I are old enough to remember covering the 1996 race when there's one precedent where something like this kind of happened. What's similar and what's different between the 96 Dole precedent and the current Ryan Trump precedent? Right. I think, you know, I guess the only thing similar is if you're thinking about shifting resources and focusing on um, congressional races, what was diff what's different, though, dramatically and significantly, is that you had Bob Dole going along with that plan in 1996. Donald Trump has no part in this plan. He is not, uh, as we know, uh, a cheerleader for his own party. As we saw today, Bob Dole was very much a person of the party. Um, that's a huge, significant difference, and that's why you're seeing the backlash um, that, that Paul Ryan is receiving from Trump supporters that I've talked to on the campaign trail, but also uh, through, you know, people emailing and saying we're leaving the Republican Party because of this. Um, but then on the flip side of that, you have Donald Trump lashing out at people who uh, uh, who, who they, he says are disloyal to him. So Hillary Clinton's going to be in Pueblo, Colorado tomorrow, which is Republican Colorado, not Democratic Colorado. And there's been a long-running debate about whether Clinton focusing on Republicans and trying to cleave them off away from Trump versus trying to rev up the base. That's been an argument been going on in her world for six months. Where are they right now in trying to find that balance? I mean, I think they're still trying to find the balance. It's interesting the place she's going tomorrow uh, is, is in the Republican part of the state, but it is a classic swing county voted for uh, Bush twice uh, and Obama twice. Uh, that is exactly where they where they have been uh, focused for the last six weeks or so uh, on counties like that, uh, certainly Pennsylvania, uh, some places in, in Ohio. It seems that she's actually made some headway there. She's now uh, in in your average, uh, you know, less than a point ahead uh, in Ohio uh, after uh, being three to five points behind. Uh, and in Colorado, where she's actually been doing pretty well, uh, I see this as a sign of confidence and a hope that at least uh, within states, even where she's already doing pretty well, that they can do a even do a little better. Our colleague Mark Leibowitz, New York Times Magazine story with an interview with Hillary Clinton. She seems, I wouldn't say giddy, but she seems pretty confident uh, and loose. 
Luce. You've watched her as closely as anyone. Is she faking this, or has she seemed confident and loose to you lately? Oh, no, she's definitely confident and, and a, a little looser. Uh, after the uh, debate the other night, she came to the back of the plane and, and was pretty, you know, jocular and, yeah. and, uh, and loose and relaxed. Uh, and, and she did not, you know, she didn't get universally uh, great notices from, from that camp, uh, uh, performance, yeah. but I think she's feeling that even if she didn't knock it out of the park uh, at, at the debate, uh, that, that they're pretty, they're riding pretty high. Okay, Ann Guerin, thank you. Thank Kaylin Hewitt Burns, thank you. Hope you both come back soon. And we'll be right back with more All Due Respect right after this. So, um, Gary Bauer uh, was the, uh, the, the, the standout guest in some ways in that he talked a lot, and he seemed to, be, to me, embody the kind of fundamental contradiction that's going on in Trump's world, right? You know, they all say we want to talk about policy, but then he immediately goes after Gore in a totally personal way. Yeah, but you can't just say it's one side, because the Democrats who, in the 1990s, said, well, Bill Clinton is a good man who did a bad thing. Both parties want to basically say, well, our side, we can forgive them because their policies are so great. But then they both criticize the other side. You know, Democrats were in high dungeon over what uh, about what Donald Trump said. There are plenty of Democrats who have done worse in their lives, and they're willing to forgive that. So I think both sides have adopted this attitude. They, and they all say, well, we really want to talk about policy, and then they don't. But it's still kind of, I mean, I, I'll just say, I mean, I, I, I like Gary Bauer, Gary, Gary Bauer. I want to have him back on the show. But it's just a, the, the, the starkness of, yes. I want to talk about policy. Oh, no, by the way, Al yes. Gore with those masseuses. Without a doubt. But again, you can have a lot of Democratic examples on this program and others, same, same concept. Peace. We'll be back with more in just a moment. If you're watching us from Washington, D.C., you can listen to us also on the radio radio at Bloomberg 99.1 FM. We'll be right back.
Won't you be my neighbor? And won't you check out BloombergPolitics.com for all your latest 2016 campaign coverage, including Tyler Kendall's latest piece about all the states where people can still register to vote this late in the campaign season. This program is now streaming live every day, 5 p.m. Eastern time on Twitter. Yes, on Twitter. You can follow at BPolitics to watch. If you can't find a TV set, find some screen that's got the Twitter machine on it. Cue us right up. Next up on Bloomberg Technology, John Lilly of Greylock Partners. Watch that. We'll see you tomorrow. Same bad time, same bad channel. Until then, sayonara. I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. In an attempt to appeal to millennial voters, Hillary Clinton today campaigned with former Vice President Al Gore in Florida. He told a rally in Miami that Clinton will make climate change a top national priority. The choice in this election is extremely clear. Hillary Clinton will make solving the climate crisis a top national priority. Gore warned that Donald Trump, quote, would take us toward a climate catastrophe. Trump's running mate, Mike Pence, told a rally in Newton, Iowa, that Trump has a singular focus. When he takes residence in the White House, he's going to fight every day for the American people. His only special interest will be you. North Carolina officials say three more people have died in the aftermath of Hurricane Matthew. The death toll across five states is now 30. Thousands of residents were ordered to evacuate as high water from the storm pushes downstream. The U.S.-led coalition is preparing to retake the Iraqi city of Mosul. Meantime, the Pentagon says it's observed Islamic State militants digging trenches and placing IEDs in buildings and roadways. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. Bloomberg Technology is next. We'd like to welcome viewers on TV and our digital platforms worldwide. And for the first time ever, our viewers tuning in live on Twitter. You can now watch Bloomberg Tech Live on Twitter every day at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. Coming up, Samsung ending production of the Note 7 smartphone. We'll ask whether the company can take the hit and dive into why the batteries have been overheating. Plus, Silicon Valley's Greylock Partners raises a billion-dollar fund. We'll take a look at what's shaping 
shaping up to be with the biggest year for VC fundraising since the dot-com bubble. And a reality check for the food delivery business. We'll dig into Square's efforts to sell a business it bought two years ago called Caviar and why it's been hard to find a buyer. But first to our lead. Samsung is ending production of its Galaxy Note 7 smartphones after reports that replacement phones had the same overheating battery problems as the original devices that were recalled. Samsung shares closed down more than 8% on Tuesday, wiping out $17 billion in market value. That's the company's worst session since 2008. Analysts are trying to understand what this cost Samsung financially. A report from Credit Suisse said halting the Note 7 could translate into as much as $17 billion in lost sales. So can Samsung absorb this hit? And what does the Note 7 crisis tell us about the limits of smartphone design? Joining me now are Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst John Butler and IHS Market Director and Principal Analyst for Samsung uh, for Smartphone Electronics, Wayne Lamb. Greylock partner John Lilly is also with me here as well as a guest host for the hour. John, great to have you. Thanks for having me. Wayne, I want to start with you because you have, you tear, you tear down many smartphones. You've teared down uh, the, the Note 7 smartphones. And I'm curious, was there anything in there uh, that you could even begin to speculate on why this happened, about the battery perhaps in particular? Yeah. Hi, Emily. Yes, uh, we've, we've gone through many of the...